Good evening, everyone. Um, we're going to begin tonight with the first full book I wrote. Uh, last class, we discussed the metaphorical nature of physical reality, and that uh, was a booklet or a uh, monograph which is really incorporated into and gave birth to this book. And then this book uh, gave birth to a, a subsequent book called The Ark of Ascent. Uh, and, um, and so we'll go through all of those, uh, th that sequence, which is about five books altogether. It, it concludes with uh, the book... Um, God's plan for planet Earth and for your neighborhood. Uh, and um, so that, that'll take several classes to get through it, but it's it's one conversation, if you will. So um, let me uh, share my screen. And we'll get started. with the purpose of physical reality. Now, we discussed the purpose of physical reality as to a certain extent last time, um, the metaphorical nature of physical reality. Uh, its purpose is to express spiritual uh, concepts, spiritual virtues and attributes and the spiritual world in metaphorical terms. Uh, what do we mean by that? In other words, that uh, uh, physical reality teaches us in terms that we can understand, concrete terms. And remember last week, if you were with us or saw the recording, we compared this teaching process that God has provided with what is called in the writings this workshop that is physical reality. Uh, uh, the same sort of tools we might provide a child to learn abstract concepts. I referred, for example, to counting blocks in order to show that when you're talking about numbers, you're really talking about a word that symbolizes a thing. Uh, and so you're sort of twice removed from the reality itself because the concept of one or oneness is an, an abstraction. So physical reality enables us to have a, our first introduction to uh, spiritual concepts by this indirection with which God uh, introduces us in our after our uh, emanation from the Holy Spirit, and we become a soul uh, uh, with an association uh, to reality through a physical body. So we're sort of operating an avatar, if you will, if you want to use a contemporary uh, popular culture. Uh, and we uh, operate that avatar and have it act out what we are trying to learn or we are trying to understand. And there are two passages I wanted to start with that are not from the book, but they're two of my favorite. They're in the book. They're two of my favorite passages uh, uh, from early on in the, my learning about the Baha'i faith that describe... Uh, how physical reality is an embodiment of or an expression of a metaphor or symbol of the various uh, levels of reality that are in the realm of the spirit. Uh, this is one of them. Within every blade of grass are enshrined the mysteries of an inscrutable wisdom. And upon every rose bush a myriad nightingales pour out in blissful rapture their melody. Its wondrous tulips unfold the mystery of the undying fire in the burning bush, and its sweet savors of holiness breathe the perfume of the messianic spirit. It behooveth wealth, uh, it bestoweth, excuse me, wealth without gold and conferreth immortality without death. And each one of its leaves ineffable delights are treasured, and within every chamber unnumbered mysteries lie hid. Um, and uh, so that gives you a very a poetic expression of the poetic nature of physical reality. 
within every blade of grass are these mysteries enshrined. And um, then this is second one, which is also from Gleanings. Know thou, and this is one we've used several times before. This is uh, says it very directly. Know thou that every created thing is a sign of the revelation of God. Each, according to its capacity, is and will ever remain a token of the Almighty. Inasmuch as he, the sovereign Lord of all, hath willed to reveal his sovereignty in the kingdom of names and attributes. And the kingdom of names is, of course, uh, a, uh, a phrase that Baha'u'llah uses to refer to the physical world, where instead of concepts, you have particular things. Uh, <clears throat> each and every created thing hath, through the act of the divine will, been made a sign of his glory. So pervasive and general in this revel <clears throat> is this revelation that nothing whatsoever in the whole universe can be discovered that doth not reflect his splendor. Under such conditions, every consideration of proximity and remoteness is obliterated. Were the hand of divine power to divest of this high endowment all created things, the entire universe would become desolate and void. Now that last phrase is particularly powerful because it means not only can physical reality and all of its manifestations and forms, whether... Uh, it'd be a, a rock, a plant, an animal, or us. Um, it not only can do this, without that capacity, it wouldn't exist. Uh, excuse me, someone's uh, microphone is not turned off. Please uh, be sure you're muted. Um, in other words, this is the specific purpose of physical reality, it is it to express in metaphorical, symbolic terms spiritual concepts and to provide us with spiritual exercises uh, so that we can begin our endless journey which of course will uh, eventually result in our rebirth into the realm where we are directly relating to spirituality rather than indirectly the book um the <clears throat> purpose of physical reality this is the first edition came out in 1987 and um i had written several books before that but this is the one that succeeds uh in incorporating the metaphorical nature of physical reality as part of the discussion but it has a lot more to it and that's what we're going to go over what are the basic sections in this argument. Now, the term argument we're going to use a lot in the series of books that are related, that are sequential, because uh, an argument is, uh, of course, not meaning uh, uh, something vituperous. It simply means uh, setting forth uh, a concept. Uh, Baha'u'llah calls the Kitabi Gan an argument, and what the purpose of that argument is, is to establish uh, how certitude is attained by understanding the scriptures and the nature of the manifestations. So, I'm going to show you, to begin with, the um, uh, various sections, the chapters in this book. Now, there are four in this first edition. Uh, the later editions, I add some things, but divide it up a, a bit differently. The same essential argument, uh, but uh, it does evolve a bit. It becomes a little bit more uh, intricate. So it begins with the search for justice. <clears throat> Uh, and and th this is called theodicy. Excuse me, let me have some tea. Uh, what is theodicy? Well, uh, theodicy is a, bl a brand or a category of philosophy dealing with the attempt to uh, justify God's ways to men. And of course, uh, unless you believe in God, it's not important to do that. <laughs> in fact, the inability to do that is what causes most people not to believe in God. How can God allow the earthquake that just occurred in Syria and, uh, and Turkey 
uh, where the where innocent people died. Uh, how can God allow the Holocaust, which was not a, an act of nature or an act of God, as uh, uh, some uh, uh, as is commonly the phrase that is commonly used? Um, and the, the the answer is important uh, to anyone who asserts a belief in a just and loving God. If God, <clears throat> the argument goes like this uh, against belief in God. If God is just and omnipotent, how can he allow injustice to occur if he has the power to deter it? And that's what this first chapter is about. Uh, and it uh, deals with what were some of the past works in the history of literature and philosophy and scripture to deal with this question. And so the first one I deal with, we've dealt with before in this class, Plato's Republic, and in particular, the concept of the philosopher king as discussed in the uh, Republic and the allegory of the cave. Uh, and uh, it's very close to the Baha'i concept, uh, with some exceptions we'll get into. The book of Job, which deals with someone who is tested. And of course, the myth of Job is that Satan uh, wagers with God that he can so test Job that Job will give up his belief. And so Job goes through all these tribulations and trials, and yet he does not give up his belief in God. So God wins the bet, but we're still left with, and so this is a mythological, if you will, it's scriptural, but it's a mythological scripture, uh, since we know as Baha'is that there is no, no such thing as a, a, a actual being who is Satan or the devil. Uh, but it is an, uh, an interesting myth because it's dealing with uh, real-life situations where people, for no fault of their own, uh, in, must un endure all kinds of tribulations and trials that test their faith if they have faith. Uh, and um, Boethius is probably someone you're not familiar with, but he was a Roman uh, philosopher who probably was uh, a Christian or if not knew of Christian theology, though his work is done in the form of classical philosophy. Uh, it is a conversation between himself as a persona, a fictional character, and Dame Philosophy, who is a figure sort of like the maiden in the Sea of Chal who tries to explain to Boethius, who is imprisoned for his beliefs and is doomed to be executed, and indeed he was, and he wrote this while he was in prison. And ironically, of course, uh, the maid of heaven and encounters Baha'u'llah in a, a prison as well. So there's a parallel there. So what is uh, uh, the solution or the answer that she gives to Boethius. Well, we'll discuss that. And then finally, I deal with Milton's Paradise Lost, the whole purpose of which is to justify God's ways to men. Uh, how can God allow Satan to exist, or how can God, even more importantly, allow Satan to tempt uh, man and uh, have man fail so that he is uh, expelled from paradise. And of course, this is a Christian myth from the Old Testament. And so the next part of this first chapter or first section is how a Baha'i would respond to each of these theories. Now, we're not going to do it right now. We'll come back to them. But first, I want to show you the structure of the argument. So this is the first thing, is to deal with what, uh, what is the problem of theodicy, how others have attempted to uh, respond to it, and then part of the same section is how does a Baha'i respond to each of the propositions or theories or arguments that these previous writers and thinkers have given. 
the section the the second section of uh, the book is simply a uh, fairly broad description of the Baha'i concept of reality. Uh, that is, what are the basic Baha'i beliefs? And of course, as you can see, these are sort of uh, in a logical order. You have the creator who brings about physical creation as a divine emanation, the fruit of creation, which is the creation of humankind, salvation as motion, uh, this is an important concept we get into, and that is uh, there is in the Baha'i faith, and this is extremely valuable, I think, in discussing the Baha'i faith, particularly those uh, with those who may be of uh, other religions and have a belief that there is some point where you are saved. There's something you can do where now you're sa <laughs> excuse me, saved and you don't have to worry about uh, the afterlife or anything. Whereas the Baha'i concept of salvation is not achieving one's particular uh, state of spiritual development, but it's an ongoing process, an endless process. Now, this can sound uh, a kind of ominous, and we discuss that in the book as well, and that is, does that mean we never get there, that we never get to the... No, it simply means as long as you're in forward motion, you're okay. Uh, so the, the fact that you never get to a single point where you don't have to worry anymore simply means you never stop learning, you never stop progressing. So it's not, it can sound negative when you first uh, articulate it, but of course it's not at all. The pre prerequisite of autonomy, and this is dealing with free will, and, and this is discussed, of course, a great deal in the writings, and that is one of the essential things one needs if one is to make a forward motion is to have the free will to do it uh, and to investigate reality and to discover what the proper motion is or where what is forward motion as opposed to regressive motion. Eternal assistance is another aspect of the Baha'i paradigm of physical reality, and that is we not only have assistance in this world through the manifestations, but also in the world to come, that we're never without assistance from God on one condition, of course, and that's from the hidden words, and that is, love me that I may love thee. If thou lovest me not, my love can in no wise reach thee. Know this, O servant. Well, of course, the same thing is true with assistance. It's there, but we have to be to recognize it and be receptive to it and do what it requires of us. The internal mechanism of justice then. Justice, uh, as we just come to the conclusion in the first section, from a Baha'i point of view, is everything doing that for which it was created. Uh, and the twin pillars of justice are reward and punishment. Uh, and they are parallel to, uh, are um, buoyed by grace and mercy of God. Because as the writings say, if we were judged solely by what we do uh, and uh, the st strict tenets of justice, then none of us would uh, fare very well. But God has mercy and forgiveness. So what is the internal mechanism of justice? This has to do with the fact that knowing what justice is, is understanding that each thing has a purpose, and our purpose is uh, to know and to worship God, a process we've talked about frequently in the past, the idea of recognition of who we are and what our purpose is, and then acting out that purpose in physical exercises or metaphorical exercises, as we discussed last time. So the same thing is true with God. Why is God grace, full of grace and mercy and forgiveness? Because that's what is just for God. In other words, justice means that which is appropriate to any existent being or any existent uh, uh, creation. So God is by definition merciful 
and forgiving. We, by definition, are a pro not programmed, but uh, given the capacity to know and to worship God. That's almost a definition, if you will, of a human being uh, in the Baha'i, from a Baha'i uh, point of view. The third section is a guide to the physical classroom, and this is uh, where the first thing we did last week, and that is the metaphorical nature of physical reality. This is where I have uh, put that discussion of how physical reality has symbolic or metaphorical lessons, that it is a metaphorical classroom for us to experiment and to learn and to gain spiritual education through physical exercises. And therefore, we bring ourselves into account each day so that we can become ever more spiritual and ultimately trying to attain detachment. Now, detachment uh, can be easily misunderstood. It's talked about a great deal in the writings, and usually it's talked about in the context of not becoming enthralled with the things of this world, whether it be riches or power uh, with one's own uh, uh, physical endowments uh, and so on, all the uh, things that uh, can detract uh, from our attempt to become spiritual. And so we become detached from the things of this world. And again, we explained carefully last time, not that we aren't to put, that we're to become ascetics or monastic. No, Baha'u'llah specifically forbids those, but it means detachment from those things that are detrimental to our progress. And ultimately, and so far as this book is concerned, it goes further in the next section to talk about detachment from the fear of death. Uh, and this is the fourth section about what is the relationship between how we do in this world and what we experience in the next world. The big question here, of course, is how do we know how we're doing? In relation to what? We can only relate our own experience to what our tests have been. We can't compare ourselves to anyone else. I'm sure you've had the experience of uh, perhaps uh, in younger years uh, admiring someone else's virtues, whether they were a great athlete or uh, a beautiful person physically or incredibly uh, uh, intelligent and so on. And you think, oh, if I only had their life. And of course, uh, you then discover that behind the facade of their life is our grueling tests and they end up in some terrible situation. I guess the simplest way of putting it, and I think I say this in the book, is uh, you wouldn't dare change lives with anyone who has ever lived if all you knew about them is that they're dead now. <laughs> it's uh, that sounds gruesome, but I, I don't mean it that way. I mean, you don't envy anyone anything. You have your own uh, destiny, your own capacity, and you're not uh, you're not uh, in a race with anyone except your own potential, which is, we're told, without end. Uh, so th isn't that interesting that you can be, uh, endowed with things that you don't know you have, and so on. And of course, there's that passage we looked at last time about when we pass to the next world, we will be made to give account of our deeds and review our life. Uh, and th that's very important because uh, we find, no doubt, as the writings say, uh, things that we have done that we are not aware of that were very virtuous and very helpful. And we usually don't remember them because they were done altruistically. We did it out of true love for someone rather than for our own gain or our own prestige. Likewise, we become aware, no doubt, of the things we have done that uh, hurt or injured others, things that we uh, knew very well we shouldn't have done and so on. Uh, but that is not something we do eternally. In other words, 
What's important to realize is, in the, and as I discuss in this chapter, is that the next world is the real world where we continue the process of progressing and participating. We aren't in, so I remember what I used to call, and I think I call it in this book, uh, the Christian heaven, or at least the heaven that I grew up with in the Protestant church as a Methodist. And that was that uh, uh, the idea that you did this well, and so you are relegated to this place. And of course, we derive that uh, from uh, Dante's uh, in fair and well, the, the El Paradiso, the, the uh, uh, Purgatorio and Inferno, the three parts of Dante's uh, Divine Comedy. Uh, but it's a, it's a concept that we see in other literature as well. And that is that there are various levels of existence in the next world. Well, no doubt we will have different levels of existence, but we're not stuck there eternally. The writings make that clear, that there is progress in the next world available for us. Um, so, uh, oh, and you'll see, I get to that in this very part here, free will and progress in the afterlife. And we'll look at those passages tonight if we have time. If not, we'll do it next time. And then the bridge between the two worlds, how our purpose becomes fulfilled. Now, what's interesting uh, is that I wrote this book originally um, when uh, the books uh, on the NDE experiences, the afterlife experiences, the uh, near-death experiences were very uh, au courant. They still are, but uh, the, this was when Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and Raymond Moody and so on, their books were uh, Life After Life, for example, were bestsellers. And of course, what they are describing are accounts by people who had for, for were clinically dead for a certain period of time. And uh, according to these accounts, uh, the individuals who had this experience didn't want to come back. They, the, even if they were there for just a few seconds in our time, it was a very lengthy experience in, in, in the timeless world of the spirit. And it was so wonderful that they can't, that words fail them and they no longer fear death. What I discovered when I studied these works, however, was that there's sort of a caveat at the end of particularly Moody's book, where he says that not everyone has this uh, delicious experience, that some had uh, a negative experience. And ha-ha, so even if the majority say they had a wonderful experience, if it's possible to have a negative experience, that means that there is some concept of reward and punishment in the next world. Uh, no doubt we uh, can, uh, you know, escalate beyond the, those those stages of, of punishment and, and so on. But... Um, so the, the fear of, uh, of it's, it is not really a fear of death, as I t say in the book, but a fear of our own decisions that we should fear. Uh, because death, it, uh, is, as Baha'u'llah says, I've made death uh, uh, a source of joy. Why dost thou fear non-existence and so on? Uh, so that was a lot of fun, dealing with the parallel between these NDE experiences and what the Baha'i writings say about the afterlife, and they are exactly the same in almost every respect, other than the fact that I guess to sell more books, these writers would leave out the, 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 those who had a negative experience. There's a lot I could tell you about this because I studied it a long time, and, and some particular individuals, whenever I've taught this in a big class, I, there were inevitably individuals who themselves had gone through such an experience and would share them. Uh, the ones that are the most consequential were those where someone had a near-death experience and could describe when they were brought back to life 
events that were taking place outside the uh, realm in which their body was uh, either on an operating table or wherever it was, and they could describe what happened. Uh, what does that mean? That means uh, that is a fairly good proof of the fact that the consciousness and the soul and uh, 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 is not uh, in the body are dependent on the body, but associates with the body. Of course, that's a very important Baha'i concept. Now, the, the next version uh, of this, or the no, not the next one, there were four printings of that, and uh, the, but the most recent edition is this one. Uh, it's the same basic material, only uh, some more added. And so the contents uh, are divided up a little more particularly. Uh, the, the search for uh, the metaphysical search for justice in a physical world, and I define what is justice and what the definition of justice was to Plato, to Job, to Boethius, to Milton. Um, the um, uh, end result of all of that uh, is that the Baha'i concept of justice uh, is the realization that we were created for a specific purpose, and therefore justice for us is to follow those twin duties or twin purposes of knowing God and worshiping God. Uh, and uh, I, I won't go into uh, what the comfort is in each of these, but for Plato, it's pretty much the same. And that is in the, uh, if you remember, in the allegory of the cave, you climb out of the land of shadows, which would be equivalent to the, uh, uh, the uh, Baha'i concept of names and attributes, the, the uh, uh, level of... Uh, the kingdom of names, and you ascend to the, the realm of the spirit. The difference is that Plato says that only a philosopher king has the wisdom and the, um, what should I say, the courage and per persistence to achieve that. And then the philosopher king has the obligation to go back down in the cave and lead others out. Well, that sounds very much like the manifestation. And indeed, I think that's what Plato was referring to are the manifestations uh, as he describes their characters and so on. The difference, of course, between that and the Baha'i concept is that we believe the manifestations aren't born in the physical world uh, having to acquire this knowledge, they are innate, innately knowledgeable, innately spiritual, because they have pre-existed in the realm of the spirit and ordained with a mission from birth to uh, accomplish what they do by way of leading humankind. Uh, the concept of Job, of course, is tenacity in fidelity, and Job ends well uh, that is, he gets everything that, back that he has lost, but in my interpretation of Job, uh, uh, I think what is being described is the afterlife, that the justice for those who have gone through needless, I say needless, who've gone through the things that the people in Syria and uh, Turkey are going through right now, and those who don't make it out of that, that rubble are who's uh, are, are, who will be put to great test because their loved ones uh, were taken. Uh, it is in the afterlife that they will see the wisdom of what they have experienced. And there is the wis a wisdom to it, and there is a wisdom to suffering. Uh, and in fact, the writings say, say repeatedly that without tests, without suffering, we will not accomplish anything. I like to compare it to, uh, I think it's a useful analogy to compare it to physical training. Uh, if you uh, want to become a, a, a runner, a, a, an Olympic runner, uh, you can't just say, well, I'm, that's what I'm going to do, and you go out and run. No, you train, and the, the more you test yourself, uh, 
the more you strain your muscles, the more you push against the pain, the more you achieve. And I think that's true for those who suffer the most in this life are most often the most spiritual individuals. Uh, we can see this in retrospect when we study lives, but of course we don't know what their afterlife experience is, but we can imagine what joy they must receive. Abu Baha talks about this a great deal uh, when he responds to letters from those who have lost loved ones and assures them that they will, that their loved ones are doing fine in the next world and that they indeed will be able to, rec uh, to see them and uh, experience their presence again. Well, I'm not going to uh, to go on with uh, uh, Boethius too much. It's it's a long dialogue, uh, but the the essence of it is that uh, uh, Dame Fortuna or uh, Dame Fortune uh, tells uh, Boethius that that good things uh, or bad things happen to good people. Uh, and uh, but that uh, it will all be reconciled in in the afterlife. So there's an afterlife there too, a very good parallel. And Milton, uh, the, 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 of course, deals with the uh, rebellion of uh, Lucifer and the rebellion, if you will, of Adam and Eve against the commands of God, though ultimately they end up uh, striving to, uh, to uh, recant their uh, uh, violation of, of God's law and, and so on. So it, it has, if you will, uh, a happy ending. Uh, the difference, of course, is, is, is you don't have uh, either in, uh, uh, in Milton the concept of progressive revelation. You have the advent of Christ as the single instance where forgiveness is provided to humankind and the single means by which forgiveness is attained. Of course, Milton was a, a, a Protestant uh, in England. The kingdom of names, uh, a Baha'i paradigm of physical reality, that is the same as, as the last one, the description of the Baha'i concept of reality a user's guide to physical reality. Uh, and this again is where I incorporate the metaphorical nature of physical reality, that uh, article uh, there, uh, the teaching technique of the manifestations. Here I get more specifically into how the manifestations themselves are metaphorical expressions of God or godliness. And so you have here, as we've noted before, Christ's statement that if you have seen me, you have seen my Father, for I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Or no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Uh, and uh, Baha'u'llah says the same thing. And, and not, not a scene in my temple, but the temple of God. That in effect, if you want to have access to God, that is done by having access to the manifestation. This is something Baha'u'llah talks about at great length in the Egon, if you recall when we discussed that, and that is that nearness to God in effect is achieved by nearness to the manifestation, which of course does not mean physical nearness, but studying their teachings, emulating their actions, and appreciating their suffering. Um, uh, the effects of the NDEs. Now here I've spelled out in the, in the uh, table of contents, the um, uh, relationship between the two experiences, and that is the uh, uh, experience of those who've had the ND experiences and how they parallel the experiences that are described in the Baha'i writings. And so I divide it into uh, 11 parts. Uh, the dissociation of the soul from the body, uh, the sense of the, the soul leaving the body, which is something they describe, if you remember, in many of them, they talk about going through a tunnel towards a light. Uh, they're just described in various ways, usually going towards a light, a source of light, uh, and sometimes a figure. 
uh, awareness of other souls. They are, uh, uh, and of course, the Baha'i writings talk about this, that in the next world, we will be aware of one another and our loved ones. Okay, and then we have the panoramic view. And what is the panoramic view? Uh, this is the idea of being able to understand reality. And it is uh, the, uh, the related to number four, the ineffable nature of the experience. Uh, and that is that uh, it's beyond words, and, and and it literally is. And if you remember in the Baha'i writings, it says that exact same thing, that if that the reason the next life is veiled from you is that if you understood the nature of it, if you had an experience of it, you would take your own life because you wouldn't be able to withhold yourself from trying to attain it. And there's a story which you may be aware of, of an individual believer who kept beseeching Baha'u'llah to let him have just, an, just a vision, just a brief glimpse of the next life. And Baha'u'llah said, no, it would not be wise for you. But he kept insisting. Uh, and so Baha'u'llah let, let him have that view, and he took his life. Uh, I have been assured, I don't have any written proof of it, that that is uh, uh, an authentic anecdote that it actually happened. I'll try to find out the source of it, or maybe one of you can. Uh, we understand uh, once we enter that realm, if we haven't already understood the purpose of what our physical life was in preparing and what the purpose of our life is from there on. Because remember, th this is very much described as, of course, in Christianity, we get this too, this idea of being born again. Well, we really are. And of course, in the writings, you have this description of this life as a period of gestation where you are in the womb, much like Plato's cave, preparing yourself for the next life. Uh, incredible peace and joy um, uh, is involved in this, of course, is repeated when all of them seem to agree that the, they don't want to come back to this life. And the only reason that some of them say they are they are given a choice, this occurs a, a, a great number of them, particularly those who are, are dying of some uh, illness that is curable. Uh, they are sort of given a choice and they choose to come back, but solely because they are needed. They have some spiritual purpose they haven't fulfilled that will assist others, particularly loved ones. Uh, and, and that's described. Negative experiences. Well, this I've already gotten into, and that is, do any of the NDEs describe a negative experience? And yes, some of them do. Um, if we have time, I'll go into some great detail about a Baha'i I know who recounted to me after having uh, uh, the, several of these NDEs, meeting someone who had a negative experience. And, and I, I asked her, I said, do you, do you think you know why? I mean, not you, that you could judge this person, but do you have any sense of what was missing in this person that uh, w would have made them not see this as something wonderful? And, and she said, yes, he he seemed to have no sense of love in him, no sense of, of uh, spiritual receptivity. Uh, and of course, that she wasn't judging him as such, but just guessing. So accountability we've discussed, that is where we, that would be one of the first thing, a loving and forgiving God, self-judgment, and the bewildered ones. The bewildered ones has to do with uh, those, and this is uh, um, also uh, supposedly authentic uh, recounting of something the Guardian told someone who, uh, I won't go into detail, but suffice it to say, the, there are descriptions from these NDEs of people who are wandering around, and this is what this Baha'i told me about this individual as well, who don't know that they are dead. They can't, they're confused. They, they think they should still be alive. And so they, uh, 
uh, are keep they keep trying to relate to and interact with those who are still in this world. Uh, now, of course, we could talk about a lot of things relationship to that. And so far as uh, is this talking about uh, the uh, what ghosts are or something? Does that? Uh, I think not. But who knows? So. Um, the result, the, the finish of this is the metaphorical solutions to theodicy, why God wants us to think and not just be automatons and just do what we're supposed to. Uh, and so I talk about metaphor and prophecy. Law is metaphor, uh, that laws are uh, have us act out the way we're supposed to act or forbid us from acting ways that would deter our ability to progress. I give the specific example of the forbidding of alcohol and other uh, substances that would cause us to lose our logical powers or to uh, uh, that I give the example of the nerve endings, for example, if your foot was hurting uh, you would want to know because you would not want to know, well, there's something wrong. Do I need to go to the doctor? Well, the, so the, uh, the nerve is, a, a, is uh, the, that negative experience of pain is actually your assistance. Uh, there, uh, there are people who, for some medical reason, don't feel pain and they are constantly in danger because they don't know if something's wrong either with them, you know, if they're bleeding somewhere. And so pain or negative experience uh, is a viable lesson for us, particularly when we violate a law of Baha'u'llah and we see, oh, this is why I'm not supposed to do this or that and so on. We experience that. Uh, so um, uh, the uh, the last section deals with the fear of death, why we should not uh, fear it, uh, that it's, it's neither a, a heaven or a hell as described in previous religions, but something quite altogether different where we are continuing our lives only on a much more inclusive and expansive level. Uh, and yet we fear death because... We, it's like, would you like to go on a vacation to this place you've never been before or never had described, but you're going to be entirely by yourself. You won't be able to take any of the things that comfort you, your cell phone uh, or your medicine or anything, and you're going to be entirely by yourself and you're going to be judged. Uh, you want to do that. And of course, that's why we fear it, because we can be as assured as we want to that it is all just and and that we will uh, have forgiveness, but uh, it, it's still uh, an unknown to us. Well, that, that's all we have time for to, to, to tonight are these four main subjects. Next time we'll take up the idea of is there free will in the next life? And we'll continue with this book, and we may get a little bit into the next book, which is called The Ark of Ascent.